I've decided that we'll carry on forever. Uh, we have such interest in these uh, episodes and these webinars and these topics. So well, I'm totally committed. This is definitely a, a passion project, as Janelle would say. And I get so much energy out of it and have been uh, meeting so many fabulous people and, and sharing their lives with you and their insights with you is a real, real privilege. So thank you to my guests. I'll be introducing the guests in a, in a few moments. I also want to thank our team at Royal Roads. We have Amara Angus and Karen Sequera who support these webinars beautifully and promote the, the topics and the teachings that emerge from these experiences. So I really appreciate, we always operate as a team at Royal Roads. It's something we deeply believe in. This is episode seven, part two of the fostering diversity and inclusion in and through sport. Uh, we've had a few of these topics that have gained so much interest, garnered so much interest that we decide to, to run another one. And of course, we could go on and on with this topic. And there are so many wonderful people across Canada who could speak uh, so insightfully to the topic. So I think we could probably have part six, seven and eight as well. <laughs> but we'll probably rally around and come around to the topic again. And of course, I find it's embedded in so many of uh, the topics that we're discussing in this webinar series. So. We always begin by acknowledging and thanking the Lekwungen and Kwisupsum people, also known as Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations communities, for allowing us to live, work, play, teach, and learn on their lands. We also give thanks to the ancestors, supernatural ones, hereditary leaders, and matriarchs, and creatures, big and small, for looking after the rich resources and cultural teachings of the beautiful land that we uh, are privileged enough to learn from. And at Rural Roads, we do learn from the land. We spend a lot of time on these lands and waters. And this is me operating in the same realm. Uh, I live on the same lands in Cadbro Bay and row on Elk Lake. And this is uh, what I was doing this morning, actually. It's been such a beautiful couple of days. Summer's here. We really believe at Rural Roads University in the power of nature and systems and the diversity that nature, of course, represents and all the learnings embedded within it. These are the old growth forest on which our campus resides and our teachers take our students out outside probably more often than we're inside. We even have an outdoor classroom, but we can constantly look out the window of our classrooms and remind ourselves of the systems, the ecology, the diversity, and the interconnectedness of all things in our world, and uh, continually be reminded of, of, of those teachings and try to embed them in all of our learnings and discussion. The truth is in nature. And the truth is in sport, too, I find. You know, I've devoted a lot of my life to sport. I'd say probably 90% of it. Uh, the other part has probably been devoted to reading and literature. But I believe in sport so deeply and want to protect it because I know what it, what it possesses and what it can teach. And that's what, of course, these webinars are about. Uh, we have a wonderful partnership with Game Plan, which is a federal organization designed to support athlete development through and beyond sport. So that we're we're really cultivating leaders through sport, uh, through national team representation. And what I love about the programs that Game Plan offers is uh, that they acknowledge the learning that goes on through sport and try to capitalize on that in a way that really helps the athlete prepare for their contributions to community, but also acknowledge the learnings and be learning while they're participating in sport. That it's not all about tactics and technical uh, learning, but it's also about those leadership skills that we're developing through sport. And that's again, another tenet of Rural Roses model that we believe the learning happens everywhere. Uh, we acknowledge people's professional learnings from all different contexts and sectors, that it doesn't just happen within the school walls or the classroom walls, but learning happens beyond academia. And we acknowledge that through our flexible admission process, of course. Um, those who may not even have a degree or may only have a, a couple of years can often find themselves ready to enter into a graduate program because we can give them credit for the work that they've done as a professional in their various contexts. And just ask us anytime, we'll tell you all about that. Uh, these webinars are all about sport, leadership, and social change and the intersection of those things. As you can see, you know, sport organizations, and I've only got a smattering of them here on my slide, 
but from all over the world are are tackling these issues through the lens of sport through the um the teachings of sport and i think i'm so proud of that you know of all the different ways that people are leveraging sport for social change and at rural roads we try to do the same we're we're all about social change uh, we focus on programs in development, diversity and inclusion, education, environment, equity and human rights, health, media and communication and peace. And of course, all of these things contribute to advancing positive social change in our world. And that's what our schools and programs reflect. We're always innovating and trying to be responsive to uh, the challenges of our world. We just you know, developed an MA in climate action. And I'm working on programming around sport as well. We know the power of sport as well, especially in the last year, we've seen so many instances of people using sport, using their platform. And I'm so proud of the athletes for doing this because I do think it is a powerful platform and for them to take up that torch and be leaders within their realms and speak out against injustices. I think. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I got a question. Super I, got a powerful. question. I got a question. We'll, uh, we'll get to questions at the end. Thanks, Amara. <laughs> and if you can mute as you come in, we'll get there. Um, this is episode seven. Sorry, I have six still up here, but on fostering diversity and inclusion in and through sport. And by in, of course, we sport has work to do, right? Sport isn't perfect. And it does seem to undulate and change and swing back and forth as pendulums do in various sectors. But we have work to do in sport. We have lots of challenges within sport around diversity and inclusion, justice, equity, but also we know sport can be a lever for change. And so how can we better use sport to advance these kinds of issues uh, or topics in our world? I always want to highlight uh, the bridge at Rural Roads. We use this in my own school of communication and culture. We use this metaphor to capture everything we're about you know our whole purpose within the school is about building bridges communication and understanding our differences our, our different cultures and building shared cultures as well but all of that starts with this concept of bridge building but you can't build a bridge until you understand the two sides that you're trying to link or connect a bridge can be a handshake a hug it can be a structure as you see here uh, it can be an understanding, a conversation, a discussion, a debate. And so it always begins with minding the gap before you try to bridge that gap. And, and that is why we think culture and communication are so inextricably linked. I wanted to highlight Dano because he was a bonus feature from our last uh, webinar. And that means that I did a separate interview with him. And, um, and then we post that video up afterward on the, on the website. And I want to also highlight that we do record these. And so we will have a, a link to this episode on our website and we'll share that out with all those who registered. And please go ahead and forward it to whoever you think may be interested. But I really encourage you to have a listen to Dano. He has had such wisdom to share. I want to introduce our guests now. Um, but actually, before I do so, I wanted to also acknowledge the uh, Tecum Loops people of the, uh, th sorry, of the, um, oh, sorry, I'm getting emotional, the Kamloops Nation really because of the discovery of those 215 graves of these young children on the residential school lands. And you know, here we are again, yet again, we have an example of the horrors of injustices, of prejudice, of racism, colonialism. And I think, well, um, I was listening to an elder from the nation speak about how we're, they're often told to, you know, let it go and get over it and move on. And, and that happens in so many realms around um, of, of injustice and, um, and discrimination. And I think, well, we can't, we can't let up. And that was his message as well. If we, if we had given up, then he said those graves would never have been revealed. Uh, they've been speaking about these horrors for many years, but they wouldn't have revealed the tragedy and the costs of this kind of tragedy. And so, you know, I really wanted to take that message forward too and, and share it today that we have to keep persisting, we have to keep fighting, we have to keep linking arms in this battle for justice. Uh, I love that JEDI acronym of justice, equity, diverse, diversity, and inclusion as well. I wanted to highlight that. 
And so now I'd like to move on to, to introducing our guests because I think we're going to have a very rich and productive conversation around the ways that sport can change and the ways that sport can leverage change. Uh, or lead to change? How can we better use sport? Dr. Janelle Joseph is an assistant professor in critical studies of race, indigeneity, and um, indigeneity, sorry, uh, at the University of Toronto, and the founder and director of Ideas Research Lab. And I'll ask all of our guests to introduce themselves a little bit more as we get into our discussion. It's always better coming from them. Gail Hamamoto, thank you for coming, VP of the Canadian Paralympic Committee and Executive Director at BC Wheelchair Sports Association. Andrea Carey, the founder of uh, and Chief Inclusion Officer, love that title, for Inclusion Incorporated, a, an organization that's committed to raising the bar in diversity and inclusion through training, action plans, and tools that allow organizations to implement sustainable inclusion strategies. We have Ruke Okome, Program Manager with Free Play for Kids in Edmonton. And free play is breaking down barriers to support kids to play multi-sport in Edmonton. Great uh, to meet you all. And we'll have a, an appearance from Adam Vancouverton, who uh, we know lots about, you know, but he has a kayaker. And I wanted to put Burlo Canoe Club up here because I just think it's really cool. Most people end up starting their sport careers in these little towns and little, uh, little clubs. And not only as a uh, four-time Olympian, but also a member of Parliament now. And we'll be peppering him with a few questions at around 12.30. He'll be here for the middle portion of the webinar. He's a Parliamentary Secretary to the Ministry of Diversity and Inclusion and Youth and to the Minister of Canadian Heritage's Sport Portfolio. So quite a relevant role that he's playing for today's webinar. And that will be great to welcome him into the discussion. We'll also be asking you to pose questions in the chat and we'll create some space for those questions and for some discussion around those questions uh, a little bit later in the program. We'll have a good discussion rolling first. We'll welcome Adam in. Maybe we'll have some time for some questions and we'll we'll monitor the chat. We're quite flexible and and uh, and flexible and kind of casual, you know, we want to mostly just have a conversation. So let's, uh, let's get rolling. I'll stop sharing. And let's begin. So why don't I begin by asking each of you to share a little bit about uh, your own experience through sport, you know, what brought you to sport? Why do you find yourself still working within this realm? Um, but and also, of course, the topic of diversity, inclusion, equity, justice, where how do you how have you arrived in this world? And is there anyone who'd like to start? You can just turn your mic on if you like that always signals to me that you're ready. And I can monitor you all. Thank you, Janelle, let's go. Thank you so much for the invitation. You know, in considering my entree to sport and my entree into equity, diversity, and inclusion um, work, they are synonymous. <laughs> I've always been doing work at that intersection. Um, you know, I was fortunate to have a family that uh, really prioritized sport for both me and my younger brother. And uh, my dad was a cricketer from the small Caribbean island of Antigua. And he um, was just very passionate about physical activity and uh, nurturing our love for uh, being outside and um, being engaged in physical activity. Uh, I grew up in the suburbs of Toronto and about 30 years ago, uh, those suburbs were um, much more uh, white than they are today. And uh, so my experiences of racism within sporting uh, cultures uh, has been synonymous with my experience of sport. And so I've always been interested in, you know, why things are not fair, how we could make things more inclusive. You know, my own brother went on to uh, professional ranks in the sport of baseball. He played as a varsity student athlete and uh, in the minor leagues with uh, what was then called the Florida Marlins. And, you know, his experience there with other men from Venezuela and Dominican Republic and the language barriers 
barriers and age barriers and the ways that um, sport can use up bodies and then kick people out, that has always been, you know, central to a kind of a family narrative of, you know, loving a sport and having it be really close to your heart and, um, you know, so central to uh, family and community practices. And then uh, whether it's through injury or um, hierarchies, uh, there has been a kind of abrupt and formal ending to uh, many of my own sporting experiences and those of my family members. And so I've always been interested in how we can uh, transform sports so that they can be more inclusive and um, at particularly around issues of race, which is a big category that for me includes issues of newcomer status and uh, immigration and colorism and shadism and um, uh, anti-black Islamophobia. And so, you know, I start with race and then once we, we uh, really think about the intersections of how people live, it ends up uh, including all different kinds of categories um, of people and also systems of oppression. Absolutely. And we'll talk more about systems of oppression and um, and hierarchies, right? They're really at the basis of all of this, this weird monistic approach to the world of supreme. There has to be some supreme, whatever. And we face it in so many different realms. Thank you so much, Janelle. And I uh, love the, you know, the reference to family, right? That, I'm sure that will come up as well. And you've already taught us so much about the expansiveness of racism and all that it touches on. Thank you. And who would like to go next? Who's ready? Oh, my God. Janelle's always a little bit daunting, but I'll uh, dive in here. Um, I grew up with uh, having the opportunity to play a number of different sports and be a multi-sport um, athlete, but certainly never particularly proficient at any one thing, but just loved it. And um, then as I headed into my career, kind of started in the recreation sport realm and then really ended up in the sport realm. But very early on um, in that, as I started to arrive at leadership tables and was the only female at those tables, and then as we opened the Pacific Institute for Sport Excellence in Victoria and saw that this brand new state-of-the-art facility was really not built for people with disabilities to participate in in the ways that their able-bodied peers could, I just got super passionate about like, how do we, how do, we do better? How do we not make these same mistakes? And um, then spent 10 years on the Paralympic Committee trying to drive some of that work forward. And um, then as I continued along my career, I had the opportunity to work on Indigenous inclusion, creating some national resources and training tools, newcomer inclusion, uh, came across some really incredible thinking and work in the space, which actually led to me to connect with Janelle, but um, through Dr. Danielle Pierce was introduced to intersectionality and the thinking about like how none of us are one identity and how we need to really think about the intersections of those identities and how that creates overlapping barriers and systems of oppression and how we show up because we have systems and structures that weren't built for everyone. And um, so that's just kind of become my area of passion. And um, as I realized that I wanted to continue to do this work, and do it very intentionally. I launched Inclusion Incorporated just over a year ago to really dive into those spaces and work not just in sport, but in other sectors as well. So that's a little bit about me. Thank you so much, Andrea, and such great work. And, and neat that you were re referencing back, you know, that's when we met back when uh, Pisces was built and just the mindset. So we talk about structures and systems, but also beliefs and values that are the little algorithms running those kinds of or developing those kinds of structural representations of uh, what's important, right? So how do we shift that? Oh, it's gonna be good. And Gail, you're ready. Let's hear from you. Yeah, I thought it was a natural transition from Andrea to myself because we've done a lot of this work together. Uh, I had the pleasure of, of meeting Andrea back when she started working with Pisces and then we served together on the Canadian Paralympic Committee Board of Directors. So we've had a lot of uh, shared journeys along the way, and I've really learned a ton from Andrea, so thank you for that. Um, I came to sport uh, as a child, as an athlete, and then as a coach for 20 years, as an official, and then as a board member. Uh, and as I graduated university, found to my you know happy surprise that sport administration was actually a career. And uh, and then even to more, more happy surprise, uh, found a sport for athletes with a disability quite, quite by accident. Uh, and began working with BC Wheelchair Sports uh, more than 27 years ago. Had, knew nothing about uh, sport for athletes with a disability, had a sharp learning curve, 
but found that it was my passion, that the community of people that I was uh, privileged to be a part of um, had shared values, uh, shared interests, and, and just, you know, this, I feel very fortunate, fortunate to have found what feels like life work, and, and clearly 27 years later, it must be. Um, and so, you know, this uh, idea of diversity and inclusion, obviously, working for, with athletes with a disability, we've been advocates forever. I mean, that's just the definition of the work that we do. Uh, and certainly it has come a long way, but there is so much work left still to do. I would say my own journey of learning um, has really evolved in, in recent years because initially, you know, we had sort of the idea that, well, we serve athletes with a disability. That's, you know, that's an underserved population. That's some kind of a homogeneic identity, but clearly it's not. You know, we talked, we've already mentioned intersectionality. And now I'd say in recent years, we're really starting to recognize that um, people bring their whole selves to their experience. And unless we're recognizing that and meeting them where they're at and really providing them the supports that they need, then we're not doing our jobs correctly. So um, in more recent years, we have developed, and I love that you use the, the bridge scenario because our, our um, sort of flagship program for recruitment and development of athletes with disabilities is called Bridging the Gap. And uh, most recently we've developed uh, an indigenous bridging the gap program because we really uh, recognize that we lacked understanding and knowledge to really uh, do this work uh, in a meaningful way that would include people. And we're still, we're very much at the beginning levels of that journey and really grateful for people who have shared their knowledge and their experiences with us to begin to um, address that. We've also developed a girls only program and uh, it, it, it just seeing that flourish and seeing that community of, of girls and especially this last year with COVID, you know, switching to online seemed like um, perhaps a step back, but what it did, it, it, it engaged people from around the province. It created connections between young girls that lived very far apart that never would have been connected. Um, so we've, it's been nice to see that grow over the over the course of the year, and we still have a lot of work to do. We still, you know, we still need to look at um, newcomers to Canada. We still need to do more work with um, our knowledge around LGBTQI2S, and and so um, I think the what strikes me most is that we are as an organization open to learning. Um, and listening and that there are so many people out there with such rich experience that are ready to share. So that's kind of where we're at at the moment. Yeah, and right away, right, you're speaking about that. I was hearing that too, that openness and that breaks those hierarchies. Like there's no one all knowing person that that is the expert. We're all having to learn together. Crucial. Thank you very much. Enrique, let's hear from you. Yes, of course. Oh my gosh, what an absolute pleasure it is to be on a panel with such incredibly awesome people. Um, um, but <laughs> uh, yeah, so my relationship with sport like started when I was pretty much could walk. Um, I was born in Nigeria, so um, back home, like uh, the idea of play is you just go outside, you find something that you can play with, and then you play. So that's kind of like where my love of sport kind of started. And then when I immigrated here when I was about 10 years old, um, that kind of kept going. Uh, I have done all the sports. Um, like I try to dabble in as many as possible. And I would like to say that my privilege um, allowed me to do so. A lot of people don't have access to that for sure. Um, and I learned a lot about myself in like a lot of sports spaces. Um, as much as I didn't recognize it then, I'm rec recognizing it now. Um, and I play volleyball, basketball, track, um, whatever sport was offered by my school, I definitely tried it. Um, so when it comes to that, those sports spaces and, you know, racialized individuals, just like myself and a lot of the, the people that we serve at Free Play, um, it's, uh, it's like I, I just recently, I don't want to say like too recently, but uh, a lot of times you don't recognize the little microaggressions that you go through when you're an immigrant coming into a uh, uh, you know, hot culture versus cold culture. So a lot of comments like, oh, like you're a tall black girl, like you must be good at uh, basketball. Oh yeah, you play track. And like a lot of those things, like I heard while I was going to school, like in junior high, high school, elementary. And I was like, oh, like, this is good. Like maybe I should do it. And I think that in a lot of ways that kind of made me try all these sports because I, I, the way that I look, like I'm five foot 10, I'm 
I'm a little, I look, I look a lot taller than I actually am, but uh, so I thought that I had to do this um, because that's kind of like what my role was um, back home in Nigeria. Like I, stuff like that isn't being said everywhere. Like it's sort of like go play, whatever, leave it there. Um, and uh, yeah, so that really, I think affected a lot of the stuff that I did because I felt like I had to do it. Um, but now that I'm in a space, I, I work for Free Play for Kids. And if you're not familiar with it, it's a program that offers free after school uh, multi sport program for kids and families in different communities across the Edmonton. And uh, just being in the role that I am in, like as a manager of a nonprofit that is sport related, you don't see that a lot. Um, I get comments all the time when I'm doing interviews, like, oh my gosh, like you're a black woman in a leadership role in a sport oriented uh, program. I'm like, yes, yes, I am. Because that's what free play is about. Like that inclusive, um, inclusiveness, like uh, equity piece, like all of that we try to address we are addressing at free play because our program is geared towards those racialized families, racialized kids that uh, um, otherwise wouldn't necessarily have access to a sport program. And yeah, so as much as our program is a sport oriented, um, what I find so incredible about free play is the fact that we combine sports and social um, skills, like social aspects of just living your day-to-day -day life. Um, we value lived experiences and we understand that for us to actually value those people like me have to be in leadership roles because I have those lived experiences and I can send those messages down to the kids that we serve. Um, sport is great and it's fantastic. It's a great way to discover who you are, discover how you operate and work in a, in a team environment. Who like it's, it's, it's a really good way to get people together for one common goal because it's, you know, it's just, let's go play a ball and score, score or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, like being in a space it's free play and seeing how much of me just being a manager or being a program like just being in the leadership role affects the kids that we that come into our program like just yesterday I'm greeting kids as they come into our uh, the Emmett's East Soccer Center and you can see in your I know we can, oh, can only see eyes right now because COVID um, but you can see in their eyes that they look up to me I can see it I can feel it I can sense it my hair is pink uh, a little a little girl came in and she's black as well and she asked oh my gosh I didn't know like black hair could do that um uh, and I was like oh we have lots to talk about <laughs> because of course of course your hair can do that your hair can do whatever you want it to do you can attach stuff to it you can take stuff out you can paint it you can all of that so like if I'm not in that space and able to kind of bridge this gap like you all mentioned um it just makes it a lot harder uh sports is an awesome way to get that pull but once you're in that space I think teaching these um kids and teaching these youth like what it means to be a good human, what it means to be a leader with integrity is our goal. And that's our prime objective. And I think that that leads to, you know, more of an inclusive space. And when we say inclusive, I mean inviting because a lot of spaces are inclusive, but they're not inviting. Um, you, can, you can say that, you know, like you're welcome to come try this, but if you don't have helmets that fit girls with braids or locks or, you know, like hijabs or whatever, then you're not you're not doing the work. So yeah, so my replay is it's uh, very vast. I wear all the hats, and uh, yeah, that's a little bit about me and my experience. <laughs> I literally my head's gonna blow off, you know, because I'm writing down all these things I want to make sure we get to. And everybody's mentioned some really important things, um, and I I'm keeping track, so we will touch on all the different points you're raising. Yeah, inviting, right? So if you're not inviting, you're not doing the work, you can make it inclusive, but if, if it's not inviting, people aren't gonna walk through those doors, no matter how open they are, right? Awesome, love that. Because uh, people in the audience will be waiting for these practical tools. You also mentioned language, how important it is. We've gotta be careful about how we say things because they can become microaggressions. They can lead to constraints and limitations. And um, you also mentioned that idea of seeing it to be it, right? So crucial to bridge, like we've got to get the people in the roles. Otherwise, uh, people, again, it affects people's assumptions about what's possible and what's not. Beautiful. So right away, lots of different um, suggestions for people to take home. Gail, you also started talking about the work that needs to be done. And that was my next question for everybody. And please, at this point, just turn on your mic whenever you're happy to chat or you have something to say, and I'll monitor that. 
uh, and make sure that we give everybody some space to talk. And thank you for promoting the various uh, initiatives you're working on. Continue to do that. Amara is keeping track and she'll put links in on the website so that when people come back, it's a whole host of resources available to them. So anything you wanna share now or later, that's great. The work we need to do. So sport is fabulous, right? We know it can be so fabulous, but it can also be a real, real problem. <laughs> there can be real problems within it. Uh, I love it because it has the potential to be a blueprint for our world for social and human development, uh, but it can also really go off the rails. We can teach a great deal through sport, but we have to be good teachers. What's the work we still need to do in sport? What's Is that the... a question for Adam Vancouverden? <laughs> <laughs> Is he here yet? <laughs> he is. <laughs> okay, good. Um, we'll, we'll get him in in a second. Thanks. Good, Adam. Good to see you. Um, I also wanted to highlight for people to, to change your view so you can focus on the speakers. That can be helpful if you're forgetting to do that or you're inundated with the numbers that are here. But welcome, Adam. Great to see you. Thanks for taking some time. We've been talking about um, all the different roles everybody's playing in their worlds, uh, the work that needs to be done, and some key tools people can be taking home with them right away and start doing right away, like being careful with how you use your your language and reference people or make assumptions. Um, but let me pose the question to the whole group and just turn your mic on whenever you're ready to speak uh, about what's the work we still need to do in sport? What are some of the challenges, barriers? Uh, I mentioned Gail had highlighted, you know, newcomers is still an area. Do you want to start off, Gail? Well, just I, I am acknowledging, you know, that we still have so much room to grow. There's, there's still, things that we haven't explored and we're not doing well yet. Um, I also wanted to talk though about telling the stories. And so even within um, Sport for Athletes with Disability, if you ask somebody, you know, what is the image they see, they probably see a Paralympian. They probably see this extraordinarily high performing individual and they probably have a really hard time seeing themselves in that person. And that's alienating for a lot of people with disabilities who just can't see themselves in sport. And so one of the intentional things that we try to do is make sure we're telling the stories of the wide variety of individuals who can be involved in sport who have a disability and the wide variety of disabilities that there are out there. And so most recently there was Limb Loss Awareness Month and uh, we did a series of video interviews with a wide range of individuals who had limb loss, who played wheelchair sport and told their story of how they got involved, what their challenges were, what they got from sport and just sharing that kind of story with the you know, broad community hopefully helps other people see themselves in that um, in that opportunity and gets people physically active and all of those good things. Um, in terms of the work that we need to do, I think within sport, I think we're at this amazing moment in time with all of the social movements that people are saying, oh yes, I really need to be more inclusive. I really need to address this issue. But I think we're at the how. I think you know, and I think that's where work that Andrea is doing with organizations is so, so important because we have so many um, sport organizations who are acknowledging that they want to do this work, that they have good intention, but they don't really know the how, or perhaps they don't have the capacity. Um, perhaps they feel as though they don't have the funding, but I would take issue with that. Um, so I just think we need to take this moment in time where we've got this lightning rod attention on this issue and really translate it into action. And, and, and the how and getting people the tools that they need. Good, and the how, there's a lot of how knowledge out there and the media can play a role in telling those stories. I mean, you think of Naomi's case right now where she's rejecting the standard application of media and uh, the, what an opportunity, like you say, a lightning rod to really change the role of media with sport and Andrea comment. Yeah, I just wanted to layer on to what Gail said and also sort of that invitation piece. But when I was at the CPC, we were working on safe, welcoming and inclusive environments. And I would say that sort of caught on in the sports system. And I think that's a really powerful opportunity to think about how do we create that, but not just like broadly as a banner and a tagline for how we do it, but how do we do that for each individual in the system? And for me, that's really the heart of this work is that we have to start humanizing the work, thinking about the person that's part of the system and how do we support them and meet them where they're at and give them that safe, welcoming, supportive environment to really thrive because we've kind of lost 
I think a little bit of the heart of why we're here and that is the people. And so we've kind of commodified sport, we've commodified performance, we've created the system that is actually now supporting why it was designed or what it should be designed for is maybe a better way to say that. And you've done such fabulous work in this area and I love how you focus on that, right? The belonging and thinking of the individuals. And again, that's right at the heart of diversity, how unique each person is, what gifts they have to bring and how do we help them feel like they belong? Yeah, love them for who they are. Ruki. <laughs> Hey, yeah, so um, just in terms of what uh, what can be done in this sport spaces, I think that just accessibility is a big one. Um, you know, like a free play for kids, we have a, a few, like a, all the coaches in our program are, they have all the credentials like you can possibly have, like as a coach for each sport. And it's epic because um, these kids that access our program, if they weren't accessing here and get, getting um, coached by these coaches with such incredible um, backgrounds and uh, credentials and all of that, they wouldn't be getting that anywhere. I think that in a lot of sports spaces, there's a there's a hierarchy where it's like, you know, if you're a fantastic coach, you're only going to coach the fantastic athletes. Um, I think it should be the opposite in a lot of ways. I think that those fantastic coaches should work with those kids that, you know, like need a little bit of extra support. Um, and I think that uh, even these coaches that are so, you know, well-versed and have all these credentials and, you know, are able to do the technical, the practical, which are obviously 100% important. But I think that another aspect to that is the fact that these coaches need to know how to work with a diverse group of kids. They need to work, they need to know how to work with kids. They need to know how to integrate mental health into their practice plans, into their programming sessions. Like, so you can come and you can kick a ball, but like, have you met, have you made a best friend today? Have you met someone new in this space? Like, it's just, it goes way beyond the, the coaching aspect in the sport, like coaching the sport. It's like mentoring, it's leadership. So like all of these coaches are available and they're there and they're doing the work and they're working with uh, all of these kids that have, uh, that can, that have the privilege to be in these spaces. But then what about the, the other, like, I would even say like 99% of these kids that need that extra support, that need that mentorship, that need that people that look like me to, you know, guide them through these uh, changes in their life. Um, people with lived experience, again, like me, that look like, you know, that look like the kids in the communities that look like um, they're part of the community to kind of support these kids through, um, you know, their, tra tra their transitional periods. I think that is also a huge part of this. And like, at free play, like sometimes like recruiting for coaches, like let's say, for example, um, right now we're recruiting for basketball coaches. There are so many um, white male basketball coaches that can do the, the work, so many, with all the credentials, all of that. But then the, there's no like people, people of color or just like any other um, like kind of coach that are in that racialized like um, um, groups. Like it, there's just, there's none. Like, cause I think there's not a lot of opportunity for coaches to, you know, like gain those experiences and be in those spaces. Like kids, the kids, the communities that we serve, like they're not predominantly white. <laughs> they come from all kinds of walks of life. Like their experiences are vast, it's diverse. And I'm not just taking, I'm talking about the skin color. I'm not just talking about culturally, ethnically, like it's all of it, right? Like there's kids with trauma, there's kids with uh, different kinds of abilities. Like all, if a coach cannot coach those, any of those kids, coach should not be coaching. <laughs> I will <laughs> leave it at that. Right and I really appreciate your strong statements, Ruke, too, because this is what also needs to happen, right? We need to speak up and be brave. And uh, I love their concept of flipping the assumed hierarchies. We're talking about coach training, coach training for human and social development, and yes, the technical, okay? But coaching is everything, mind, body, heart, because sport is, right? Right on, thank you. And Adam, I know we have you for a limited time, and I saw your mic come on there for a minute. I'm sure you have something that you'd like to share. What are you working on? What are you focusing on, or what do you think we need to focus on uh, from your perspective and your role? Well, thanks so much, Professor Willinga. It's nice to be here. And hi, everybody. I'm sorry that I had to come a little bit late, and I apologize that I have to leave. Uh, we are currently voting in the House of Commons on a whole bunch of really important bills, um, one of which we just passed, which is to develop a national framework for diabetes research, uh, which is 
it has implications on physical activity, recreation, and sport because we, as we all are very, very well aware, uh, one of the uh, the greatest predictors of whether or not one will develop uh, diabetes in their lifetime is is whether or not they're physically active. Um, we are we are all champions of sport. I can tell. I've only been here for a few minutes, but I can tell this is a, this is a fairly uh, you know sport loving group, and and I love that. I'm a kinesiologist. I competed for Canada for Summer Olympics, and I'm very very grateful to be uh, the parliamentary secretary for sport in the Canadian government. So I've got my dream job right now. I've got two parliamentary secretary roles. I'm not taking it for granted. My first one is to serve with the Minister of Heritage on the sport file. And my second one is with the Minister of Diversity, Inclusion and Youth. So I get to work on anti-racism initiatives, LGBTQ2 plus initiatives across the country with community-based organizations, community serving organizations and with kids. So really there's so much intersectionality there between uh, you know, physical activity, sport recreation, anti-racism, and working on inclusion with kids in this country that I, I honestly am so grateful uh, that my constituents sent me to Ottawa to do this great work. Um, my big project that fits into the category of what we're talking about today in terms of accessibility and reducing those barriers between people and physical activity comes down to one program that I advocated for. So it's we, we don't need to talk about COVID-19 ad nauseum because we're all sick of it. Um, but we, we are still in this pandemic and we have been for 14 or 15 months and it's had a really, really negative impact on our ability to, to do sport, to implement sport and play programs, uh, to take advantage of recreational opportunities. And that's had a negative impact on our social development and our human development, as you mentioned, Professor, but it's also had a really detrimental impact on our physical health as well. And, and that needs to be um, looked at, but we need to invest as well. We, we've demonstrated uh, with this government that we have the capacity to invest, invest in an emergency. And I think there is an emergency that's been enhanced by this. And that's an emergency of, of sedentarism, an emergency of, of sedentary living. And uh, you know that needs to be looked at from a holistic perspective. What are these barriers? And, and how are people being prevented from achieving their best possible health outcomes through sport, physical activity and recreation? So uh, what I advocated for, uh, going back to September, I started uh, a working group with various MPs and we all came together to talk about the, the importance of community sport, grassroots sport development, sport delivery, um, not talking about funding sport from the federal government perspective for the purpose of winning medals at the Olympics or building national teams, but more so for positive health and social development outcomes as we're talking about here today. It's a different impetus, it's a different relationship, it's, a, it's gotta be a different uh, delivery mechanism too. So in the budget, if you're interested in having a look at the budget, uh, in, in English, it's on page 201, it's called Canada's Active Recovery. And what that is is $80 million that's gonna go over the next two years to Canadians to reduce uh, the various barriers between people and physical activity. I put them into three categories. That's the literature that I sort of ascribe to, the three categories of barriers between people, physical and activity and better health outcomes are first and foremost, financial. Sport is expensive, particularly for kids in lower income and under-resourced uh, communities. I grew up in community housing with a single parent and uh, sport wasn't a given in our, in our you know, childhood. My brother and I loved to play sport, but the free sport opportunities were the ones that we kind of gravitated towards. So we didn't necessarily receive all of the benefit from like positive male role models in our lives. And, uh, and I don't want to suggest that role models are always male, but as two boys being raised by a single mom, that was important to my mom. Uh, so coaching was really, really important. And, uh, you know, the teamwork aspect wasn't always uh, as, as well enhanced through this, the free sport opportunities in our community. Um, but when I got down to the canoe club, that's where, uh, you know, I found all of the benefits that sport, physical activity and recreation provides people with. Um, so that that financial barrier was relevant to me as a, as a young person and relevant to me as as a kid in a community that really just wanted to, to have the resources necessary to play. The other two are, are being identified through um, or worked on through other funding mechanisms. So the one is is uh, environmental. So our built environment has a really, really profoundly negative impact on our ability to, to do recreation and, and do sport. Uh, there are recreational deserts in Canada. You know, some communities just don't have facilities. They don't have enough parks. There's just not the availability of the necessary infrastructure to be physically active. Obviously, in Canada, we also have to contend with seasons, and that has an impact on the environmental barriers. But the third, uh, which is a bit of a grayer, uh, you know, amalgam of, of barriers, is what I call the socio-cognitive cultural barriers to, between physical activity and, and people. 
And, and that comes down to education and familiarity and comfort and a sense of belonging, a sense of, um, of safety. And, you know, it's tough to try something new. Um, but as a sport community, we've got to get better at inviting people in, uh, welcoming them in, making sure they don't feel intimidated or, or isolated or terribly different. That requires us to do that through a GBA lens, through an inclusive lens, through a diversity lens to ensure that our our, our environments, our places and spaces for play are inclusive and accessible for everybody. And that's what I hope that Canada's active recovery funding is going to achieve, is basically demonstrate that if we make sport accessible, available, uh, welcoming and safe for absolutely everybody, we'll see the positive health outcomes that all of us on this call so strongly believe in. Great to hear. And I'd love to dive more into the socio, cultural, emotional, like those things have been what we've been talking about, that the finer details of being invitational. How? What's it going to take? Where could that money go? Who could access it? What could we build? What do we need to do with that? Yeah, go ahead, Ruki. <laughs> yes, of course. Um, I. Uh, that's great, Adam. Thank you so much for sharing. That's so exciting. I'm glad that there's money coming. Yeah, that's exciting. Um, yes, <laughs> I feel like Smith. I love it. Um, so, so in terms of like where the money should be allocated to, um, I think that it should like we work with uh, Jumpstart, and they're a huge supporter of a lot of grassroots organizations. Um, and I think that that's where that money should go. Mm -hmm. um, just to preface what I said before about those coaches and um, making sure that these coaches are well-versed like uh, in like the full, um, like, okay, yeah, we're teaching you sports, but we're also gonna teach you how to be a good human and a, you know, a good um, positive role model in your community. I think that it's important that we're also like providing money to these grassroots um, organizations that are doing the, job, the work. Like at Free Play for Kids, we integrate our social emotional learning um, document into our programming. And that's the coaches are doing it. I'm doing it while I'm there. The youth leaders that pick up the kids in our program are doing it. So like the, uh, I think the criteria for being able to receive this funding should be maybe like kicked up like a notch because a lot of the NSOs and PSOs, those are provincial sports organizations or national sport organizations, they take the money and then it's just, you know, it's the same thing. Like it's just the same thing over again, like where they, you know, the money mostly goes towards, you know, that elite, like we're trying to get the, the next Connor McDavid to go on there. Like we're trying to get the next LeBron James or, you know, but I think that now that we understand and we see that there's such a gap in that uh, in those spaces, I think that that money needs to go to the little guys that are trying to bridge those gaps, like are trying to close those gaps or fill it in with opportunities for families and communities to access. Um, and that requires a lot, that requires a lot of operational um, duties. Like we need coaches to be well, to be well trained and, and versed in all of the things that they need to know. Um, we need coaches that can like coach coaching um, um, employment uh, opportunities that are full time. Like right now, like being a coach full time and getting paid like a livable wage is close to like it does not exist unless you're like in those top higher higher positions. So I think that yeah, the little guys like deserve to to get this fund. Like they they they're the ones doing the work. And I think that for the PSOs and NSOs that are saying that they want to make the spaces inclusive, they want to you know do the work. Then okay, like that's great. Let's uh, come up with a criteria. Like as long as you're doing this, you're actively doing it. You're actively doing what you're saying. You're making sure your space is inclusive. You're making sure you're reaching as many kids as possible, not just the ones that can reach you because they have a uh, privilege and access. Um, as long as you're meeting this criteria, then yeah, like absolutely. Here's some funds, go for it. But I think that the, the, the folks that are doing it already deserve, deserve to get that fund. But yeah, that's my uh, two cents. <laughs> Thank you, and Janelle. I'll piggyback on that because uh, through the recreation collective work I've done, it's funded by Shirk through a New Frontiers uh, in Research Exploration grant. Uh, we actually looked at the sport policies of 143 NSOs and PSOs. So I can tell you uh, very clearly that a lot of the inclusive sport policies say things like, 
all athletes will be provided with equal opportunity to enjoy all sporting opportunities that we can provide, literally. And so our analysis shows that, you know, generally speaking, Canadian sport policy actually advocates its responsibility to be inclusive, does not recognize that inequality exists. We need to start with a statement that says, you know, this the, the legacy of this sporting organization is a colonial, <laughs> exclusive institution. And if we're not starting that, then with that, then we are ignoring the 215. We are ignoring the histories that have kept, systematically have kept uh, people with disabilities, women, Indigenous people, newcomers, uh, trans folks, have kept them out. It's not an accident that they haven't been showing up. Right. And when we think about uh, coaching, uh, especially, you know, the nurturing those coaches from a, a young age and then paying them and not leaving coaching responsibilities only to volunteers who could uh, afford to uh, give of their time, you know, that that systematic exclusion uh, reproduces itself generation after generation. And a lot of the inclusive policies serve only to declare that an organization is inclusive. We are committed to anti-racism. We, we um, revoke, you know, any kind of um, responsibility essentially is what they're saying. That's my translation. Uh, but the, the fact that the, the policies are not actually accomplishing the inclusion that they set out to accomplish. It's merely by declaring that we want to be welcoming and that's as far as some organizations go. So I would say that um, the, the funding needs to be tied to accountability. It needs to be tied to actual change. It needs to be tied to um, boards being uh, diverse. And um, I don't know that quotas is always the way to go, but the non-quota situation that we have going on right now is not acceptable. So, um, you know, a lot of racialized folks, especially my experience and my research shows that uh, we, ex we experience sport organizations as um, as gaslighting us, as telling us that they are inclusive when we can see that there are no racialized coaches here. Another area of my research is with Ontario University Athletics, and I'm doing research with student athletes, coaches, and sport administrators within the Ontario University system, and it's very clear that there is a hierarchy, that the vast majority of the coaches are uh, white. Uh, there is a more recent uh, gender balance, which is coming in some sports, but not in all, and especially not in um, all of those sports that in some cases have a uh, great, uh, in Ontario, a great uh, racial diversity. And yet, you know, basketball coaches, football coaches are almost exclusively white. And so we need to really think about uh, the intersectional identities that uh, the athletes, coaches, sport administrators hold and how to nurture that from a really young age because the policy influences the hiring which influences the mentorship which influences you know yeah. the feelings of belonging and all of those things I think are, are interrelated and I would like to see a really uh, concrete uh, policy initiatives that declare what the problem is that we have inequities here and uh, suggests more than just commitment to change, but the concrete steps that sport organizations will take to make change and how they will be held accountable, how that can be measurable after they get this money. How are they going to show it? Because it's the right thing to do. <laughs> Not because it's, because often I hear the, the argument that, well, economically, it makes sense to have a diverse sport. Oh, give me a break. Just do it because it's actually reflective of our society and do the right thing and let's get on it and make the changes. Love it. Good. Other comments, Gail. I couldn't nod my head hard enough when you were talking. <laughs> I was, you know, for a long time, I've been saying, you know, we need to use the levers, and I, you know, in other instances, I call them the hammers of funding and accountability to see change. Because, you know, having done this advocacy work for more than twenty-five years and said it nicely around a table for twenty-five years, we're not seeing change fast enough. We're not seeing concrete change, and until our funding agencies say, this is the, this is the standard and you're gonna implement it, not just have, have these statements as you say, I don't think we're gonna get real change. I don't think we're gonna see um, organizations motivated to actually make the change. And, and I say that on the one side, and then I firmly believe on the other side that we need to provide the education and the resources to help them make that happen. So, you know, I'll, I'll give an example in, in, in the work that I do with athletes with a disability, 
you know, you have provincial sport organizations who say, yes, yes, I want to do this, um, but then realize that they need to have a fleet of chairs um, to be able to provide that introdu introductory opportunity and are at a loss with how do we afford them at $3,000 to $8,000 a piece and how do we take care of them and what's that knowledge. So there needs to be a combination of here's how we help you get started and here's the hammer if you don't commit to this work. The other point I wanted to make, and you and, and I think you touched on this really, really well, was this is a long game. So people want quick answers, they want easy fixes, they want, oh, we, we made this policy, we, we did this thing, but it's the long game. So how do we achieve parity on boards um, and diversity on boards, uh, you know, recognizing all that intersectionality? Well, we have to start nurturing that talent and we have to start recruiting those people. And whether they start on committees or whether they start as volunteers in the organization, we have to start with that work so that they become ready to take on those board positions. And, and the same holds true for the coaching positions um, that we spoke of. Uh, and other leadership positions, we have to start nurturing that. And it's a long game and we have to commit to the long game because there's no quick fix. And my fear is that this social movement right now and the lightning wrong I spoke of, spoke of earlier is going to fade. People are going to be like, okay, we were all super fantastically, you know, it, it, um, enthusiastic at this point, but you're telling me I have to do this work for 10 or 15 years. Like, yeah, I got other things I got to work on. So we really have to have accountability understanding of the long game, education and supports to make it all happen. And I know we only have Adam for a few more minutes, so we'll put you in the hot spot on that again. And, and you know, there is motivation. Uh, we have a lot of hands up ready to help a lot of people with the how knowledge and research background. Um, how do we how do we connect the, the funding to the actual action that is going to ad address these metrics, which are what we value? That's all a metric is. How do we do that? What are your plans, Adam? What do you think? Well, first, first, uh, I, I want to thank uh, Dr. Joseph for uh, for her comments, and I think Gail and Ruke and I uh, agree that now we're going to have to get tested for a uh, for a concussion as we are nodding for like four minutes, just <laughs> going like hardcore, like like uh, in in a just one hundred percent agree with everything that you said in terms of the need for sport to catch up to the rest of society in terms of. Maybe not the entire rest of society, but it's certainly in terms of various movements that are um, that are underscoring the importance of all of the, the things that you mentioned. Um, it's my ambition that some of this uh, Canada's active recovery funding can go to achieve that. I, I think it's it's impossible to fund community sport from a holistic and grassroots perspective without focusing on um, the core um, the the core like nature of sport to have a positive impact on. Uh, on, on, on people's social development the, the reason that i that i started to, to flip you know how we fund sport in canada was precisely for that because if you're constantly just funding sport you know sprinkling money on the top to get a medal in 18 months at the olympic games then you know how is that going to trickle down it's the same idea as giving millionaires tax breaks to solve poverty like it'll never work. Trickle down economics doesn't work and, and trickle down sport funding for community and grassroots development doesn't work either. Mm -hmm. And increasingly for, for decades, I was on the board of directors of the Canadian Olympic Committee for a long, long time. And with a bunch of athletes, we were talking about how the pyramid, if you want to call that, of, of sport and the availability of, you know, tons of young people at the bottom of that pyramid. Uh, sorry for describing it as a hierarchy, but it was becoming increasingly siloed because young people weren't attracted to, to organize sports as much. And many of those who were didn't have access for many of the reasons that I identified with respect to the barriers. So, you know, disposing of those barriers as quickly as possible is one aspect. Increasing that, that, that field of play in the bottom of the pyramid is so, so important. Um, if we're going to, you know, start looking at all of the things that sport can achieve, then uh, we need to measure them too. When we're not measuring a lot of outcomes, and I, I'm speaking in an academic forum with a lot of people with, uh, with an academic background, and I know that we all agree that you can't change what you don't measure, but if we're willing to actually you know, apply some science to this and look in the long term and follow, certainly follow our guts on the things that we know, but then measure those outcomes, then what I can guarantee is Canada's active recovery funding won't be a two-year program. It'll be something that's ongoing. So that's actually, you know, what I need your help, mm -hmm. if I can, if I can beg it. Um, when when we are rolling out these funds to various community serving organizations across the country, we need to be able to demonstrate in in an 18 months or two years time that it really had that impact. 
that it increased participation, that it increased enrollment, and there was a positive impact on various communities as a result. And that it inspired organizations, big national level organizations to change some of their mindsets, to change some of their practices, uh, to be more reflective of the communities that they serve to, to they commit to serve. Um, so you've got my commitment to always have an open mind. Um, I know that uh, we've got a lot of work to do in Canadian sport, but that's why I ran for parliament, not because Team Canada is perfect, uh, but because building a nation and building a movement requires one brick at a time. And I'm committed to that long-term work. And look, building a nation is never done. It requires a little bit of work every single day. And I think sport is one of the one of the many vehicles that uh, can get us to the finish line. So I thank you all as, as friends of sport and uh, and people who are committed to this, this movement and growing it and growing it in the right way. Continue to do your work and thank you for this forum. Uh, and I'm, it's just a, a sincere honor and privilege to, to join you here uh, and, and to listen to some great ideas. Thank you, Adam. Thanks for joining us. And we will see you again. You'll hear from us. Hope so. <laughs> so you probably watched me like pull my phone out of my like away from my face a couple of times. That's the way we're voting in 2021. And if I can vote for my dining room table in the House of Commons in Ottawa, then anything's possible. So let's use COVID-19 as, as an opportunity to rethink the way we do some things and to refocus on what our goals are and what our aspirations are and you know move forward as quickly as possible because this COVID-19 thing is going to be done in no time and we're going to have a country to rebuild. Absolutely. Great to see you and thanks for the work that you're doing and thanks for joining us. We'll see you again. Take care. Thanks everyone. Bye. Have a good day. Bye-bye. So I'm looking in the chat and I'm seeing some comments and questions about roles we can play at various in various um, realms of society, right? So in a club, uh, in a, a city, what's what are the people who work for the city or a facility owner? What are our roles in making these kinds of changes? Um, I also hear that, you know, if there's funding available, there are a lot of people who are doing great work, including all of you, and you want to help or you want to be connected, but how do we facilitate that? Um, how do we convene those conversations, those discussions? You know, what's that going to take? So comments on that. What are some roles or advice that you have that people can do today, tomorrow, next week, and 15 years, over 15 years? What do you think? Um, I don't mind kind of kicking that off. And uh, thanks for the questions. I, I think what kind of resonated for me as I looked at uh, the question, particularly around sort of cities, facility owners and operators, what's their role? I think first and foremost, it's kind of the openness to change and to thinking that there might be a different way to do things and that we might have built things in a way that, you know, unintentionally or maybe intentionally is exclusive of certain populations. And so how do we kind of strip that down and start to think about like who's not here why are they not here inviting them in to understand and build the relationships um, so that you can start to co-create what could be going forward and as i look at the pandemic and it's like we've actually even further kind of eliminated or excluded people through the pandemic from opportunities around sport and physical activity because it's been that much harder or there's been that many more restrictions on um, individuals activities based on transportation limitations or health limitations or uh, safety limitations whatever they might be but we haven't really started to look at like okay, what more do we need to do to actually invite them in and include them in our solutions going forward? So there's that piece around sort of that openness and kind of rebuilding and rethinking how we shape things. And then I think there's a massive education piece. And, you know, if the last year and a bit has shown us anything, it's that we really don't know what we don't know. And, you know, whether that's been um, by nature of our education systems and the media and how messages have been portrayed that is shifting and we all have a responsibility to step up and start to learn what we don't know and um, there's lots of amazing free e-learnings that are out there there's tons of webinars this year i can't even count how many amazing webinars i've been on um, and how many of you have been hosting some of those or part of them um, and then, you know, there's tons of reading, like there's just so many places to get information. So what's your starting point? How are you going to move this forward for yourself and for your organization and be really intentional about that, those steps forward as you go? Gail. 
Yeah, I just want to build on what Andrea is saying and from a sort of a practical ground level perspective, you know, I think a lot of the community facilities uh, and organizations have been built as, as has been referred to earlier on these sort of hierarchical, um, traditional kind of ugh, horrible formats. And so what you see is that um, access to facilities for programs for girls, for programs for people with disabilities are slotted into these little, oh, we have this space left over, we have that space left over, you can come at eight o'clock on a Friday night um, in a community that you might not feel safe. Like it's just, we have to blow that up. People that run facilities have to look at the full scope of their programming and say, you know, how, how are we allocating space and how is this representative of our community that we serve? And how is this equitable? Because right now it's not. So that's one aspect in a very practical sense. Another aspect is what are the minimums that we consider to be a successful program? So we butt up against this all the time for athletes with a disability or participants with a disability, because typically they're looking for eight to 10 registrants to have a program run successfully. And what we know is that you're lucky if you start a program for people with disabilities with one or two participants, yay, success. And then those one or two become three, become four, become six, because they speak to each other, they create a community, they have peer support, and then it becomes um, what you're hoping long-term. It may not ever be 10 people, it may always be six. And so as an organization that serves that community, we've had to approach recreation centers and augment their budgets, which we shouldn't have to do. We do that so that we can seed programs and make sure they get going. But you know, if we're doing this correctly, recreation centers and the like should be acknowledging that two, three, four for an underserved population is a suitable number and funded accordingly. And so those are just a couple of really practical examples on the ground that we see all the time. I'd like to build on those comments, especially around the what don't we know. Um, Andrea, I imagine there are other uh, researchers here on the call and, you know, the the work that I've done with the Gender Equity Hub uh, for Research and Sport, Women and Girls Sport uh, is really clear that there is so little research on racialized women and girls in particular in Canada, so little. And so, you know, we need to really expand even just our ideas of what sporting communities are. And uh, to build on your point, Gail, you know, go to where those go to where those communities are, because we're I think the perspective is, I have this facility, I have this program, I want people to come, I'm going to be inclusive, I'm going to bring them in. When, you know, people are doing Bollywood dance in their living room, people are playing capoeira in the park, people are doing lots of things that maybe don't count as sport in the way that we think about it or the way that we know it. And so we need to tap in and build relationships uh, with these communities so that we can not just be extractive uh, to, to take their data and give it to the government, but to really build communities, build relationships, and then maybe we can transform the idea of offering a program from this is something that happens within my facility or with my staff to, you know, this is something that happens in partnership with the Somali Canadian community that's already organizing themselves, right? I think there's so, so much physical activity that may not be defined within our strict um, sport definitions uh, that's already happening at a grassroots level. And that's where we need to sprinkle that money. <laughs> Absolutely, in partnership. And Dan O'Thorne and I had that conversation around, you know, it can also almost appear exclusive to have the Indigenous games, but they need those games to happen so that they build their sense of identity and, and are truly um, feel at home and belonging and connected. And then in partnership, right, partnership, not assimilated in or, yeah, that's not the answer. So, so crucial. Same with para games, right? We need to have separate things for a little while to and same with you know women's groups frankly <laughs> where we want to actually talk and sort out some of the challenges and then we'll start reaching out our hand to partner partner uh, not be just pulled in and, and told to become uh, like those who exist already other comments around this what else can we be doing right now uh, something that occurred to me is this idea of being known you know many of you are doing so many great things and people on the call are as well and so be known, like share, make an effort to put your examples out. We have a question around examples of good allocation policies, you know, um, share, share, share. And we'll do our best at railroads, of course, too. And I know all the universities are trying to do work around this, but what else? 
I thought the numbers piece that Gail mentioned from a participant standpoint is really important, but I'd also layer on, um, and it kind of ties back to something that Ruke said earlier in that, you know, we need good coaches. It's really hard to navigate some of those systems to even train the people in the way that you want them trained. And then I kind of think back to an example in BC where the Indigenous Sport, Physical Activity and Recreation Council was very intentionally leading into NAG games, trying to train more coaches in a particular sport, and I won't call it the sport, um, but in Indigenous communities. So smaller population, the sport had a policy that they had to have 10 people to run a coaching course, despite iSpark saying they would offset the the additional cost, like it wasn't a cost piece, they were like, no, well, this is our policy. And it's like, but your policy doesn't make any sense for this context. And here's a partner from a, you know, a community that's already facing barriers, trying to break down the barrier that you're listing and you're still not open to shifting policy. So kind of like, what are those exclusionary policies that we continue to perpetuate because that's how things were done rather than really kind of cracking it open and going, well, you know, if we want more coaches and we want more diverse coaches and we want more diverse participants, what do we need to shift to do that, to support them, to actually have the opportunity to participate? And like Janelle referenced earlier, this work the Recreation Collective has been doing over the last few years around sort of this policy analysis. And it is fascinating at you know the yeah the, just sort of like how we've structured some of those policies that actually perpetuate the harms and the exclusion rather than creating inclusion and this is in an inclusion policy and so we're just about to start to move some of that work to kind of mobilize it with a few uh, pilot sport organizations I'll call it to try and build a policy template essentially that would um, be a stronger way forward for folks to jump onto. So um, yeah, I just wanted to give a little shout out to the Recreation Collective as well in that because it has been such incredible work and such rich learnings for me personally as we navigated it. Love the shout outs and love the, what you're touching on here is real cultural shifts, calling out, Absolutely. calling out the artifact, right? Calling out the policy. Yes, we can be creative with it as one of our guests is suggesting, but but also to call out the assumption that underlies it. There's a lot of wringing of hands sitting around board tables about making a statement or the commitment as Janelle was touching on, but we need to actually like get, get to work. It's obvious what needs to change in a lot of situations and then be brave enough to just call, uh, call into question some of the assumptions that are driving uh, what's occurring in our world. Awesome. And Gail has something to say here. Yeah, I just wanted to build on how policies can be exclusionary. And when you look at it from a coach education perspective, a lot of the standard coach education processes through the National Coaching Certification Program um, are not inclusive of people with disabilities. So we do a lot of work trying to transition our athletes into coaching roles. And I'm, I'm happy to say that the majority of our provincial coaches that are paid have a disability. But the roadblocks that they've had to come up against because the coach education system is built for an able-bodied coach, you know, okay, well, you need to be able to demonstrate this in this sport and have this competency long jump or, you know, whatever it might be in, in tennis, you have to be able to do this thing. Well, and a, a person with a disability um, in some cases are, are not gonna be able to demonstrate that skill, but they are uniquely positioned and highly qualified to be um, a coach in their sport. And so we've worked to remove some of those barriers and that work is ongoing, but that's an example of you know, people just banging up against a wall, again, against a policy or against a structure that's not inclusive. And Peggy uh, in the chat is affirming that concept, you know, to do the work of aligning your values, beliefs with your policies that um, even though you don't have enough people run it anyway, let's just make things happen. But but also point out, hey, this is exclusionary and we need to change it now, not later, not go through a giant process to reapprove all these documents. Cool, cool, cool. What about what Adam was saying? I was a bit, um, I got very exhausted because I feel as an academic, I'm often tasked with proving that this will help performance. You know, safe sports going through this right now, and that's an area I focus on, that, um, that taking care of a human being will actually help them perform. <laughs> Like to me, that just seems very obvious uh, that, of course, it's true. How much, you know, how did you, how do you respond to that? That we have to prove it and then we'll get the funding uh, enduring into the future. It'll be more perpetual. Ruken? 
Yeah. So uh, just to touch on that a little bit, I think that a, a lot of times, like we're so focused on the quantitative part of, uh, um, you know, running a program or being in a sports space that uh, we forget that a lot of what like we do in those spaces is actually qualitative. Like you can't measure it because for example, we have one uh, incredible youth leader that has been part of our program for a couple of years. He started as a junior leader, like coaching the little kids with the support of uh, um, <clears throat> support coaches that were there to support him, like, cause he was in high school and because he was given that opportunity to do that. Um, fast forward uh, a year after he's done the program and like COVID hits, free play, you know, we're not doing a program. The kid just shows up one day and he's just like, hey, can I support you in any way? Unprompted, okay? And that's because of the mentorship that he experienced in our program the year prior. Shows up, uh, volunteers his time, unprompted, by himself as an 18, 19 year old kid um, doing that. And he supported us throughout the summer because we started doing hampers and we're providing the, like we flipped within like two days providing hampers to about 120 families um, every week. He helped like coordinate volunteers, do all of that. Um, he is now like our one of our, one of the best youth leaders that we have in our program. And um, he has shown so much growth in this two years. This is an, I, I was 18, I was 19. <laughs> It's like, it's super rare to find, uh, to get an individual that is so devoted and committed and, and sold and, and passionate about helping others. During COVID, unprompted again, he's volunteering and helping us. He's also running his own programming session with the kids in his community because he recognized that the families were struggling to do so. He did that all summer. That, that, I mean, obviously this kid has underlying incredible heart, big heart, wants to help, absolutely give it to him. But the mentorship and the leadership um, learning that he got in our program is such, plays such an important role in it because he's advocating for our kids in our program. He's making sure that they're getting the experiences that they will never, that they thought that they'd never be able to. This winter, we were able to get our kids to the Edmonton Ski Club because they're an awesome nonprofit. Shout out Edmonton Ski Club. Um, but uh, we, we got about 100 kids in our program that otherwise wouldn't be able to ski snowboard because it's just such an, an inaccessible um, activity for a lot of families. We got to do that. And he was the first one to ask, is this going to be available next year? So when we say that the, the re like uh, we have to be to register like the results or just see how what we're saying works, look at the communities, you know, go in there. Look at all the people that are running for school board trustee in this year, in this municipal, like uh, their election in October. You know, it's the, these are the results that you can't necessarily jot down in a number, but you can see that you can feel. Um, I'm like writing a reference letter for this kid because um, he applied, he is uh, sending an application for um, our scholarship, a scholarship that is being available. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm bawling my eyes out because I get, I got to, I got to be a part of this kid's journey throughout our program and while he's still in it. You know what I mean? So like, it's like great. Like <laughs> the measure, the measurements, like being able to measure that. Yeah, like sometimes it's important, but I think we need to look past that because sometimes you can't measure it. The fact that we're operating, the fact that free play is available, that is a measurement of it in itself. Because if we're not doing this, who else is gonna do it? I don't know. <laughs> exactly. I love the I love the concept of what you're describing is like valuation, valuing, and and it takes the whole story back to Gail's point about telling those stories, and you know, send that story. I would send that story to Adam because I think that is the best uh, capturing evaluation of what you've described, an initiative that has led to, and you didn't actually mention a number of numbers, <laughs> you know, a hundred and. Uh, the years and the repetition and like that is quantitative, but there's also all this other stuff that you can capture. We don't think of it as measuring it, but you have captured it beautifully in your whole story and your the emotion captured within that too makes it even more beneficial. We like to talk about um, winning at all costs or sport with costs, but there are sport with benefits. And so how do we capture those benefits and share them? And we all have a voice in that. Send it forward. And we're doing so right now. All right. And we have a question for Dr. Joseph. Given your research and findings, what are some applicable approaches for fostering inclusivity towards women in sports, particularly availability, participation, funding, social stigma, viewership? Hmm. 
what are some you know things that have worked in your mind for fostering women in the in the few studies so i can speak about my personal research but also this uh, comprehensive literature review that we've done on uh the research on uh, Canadian women in sport. And uh, from that literature review, it seems that the programs that have really run have been uh, these kind of grassroots programs that uh, take the initiative from the participants. So it might just be three new immigrant uh, women who uh, meet in a church and then they start a walking program and then they walk with each other after the service every day. And, you know, some people don't count that as sport, but that might be the impetus that gets them to uh, to feel well, to feel connected and then involved in maybe more uh, rigorous physical activities. So the, the kinds of programs that work uh, have been initiated by people in that community. Sometimes it's sport administrators who come from those communities, who have those connections, who can speak to, speak the language of, literally sometimes, the language of the community members uh, and uh, bring them in. Uh, but always it's um, focusing on, you know, what is it that uh, women are particularly asking for? There might be a, a community where like all they need is childcare. If you could just provide the childcare in the next room, they'll come, they'll do the exercise, they'll stay for three hours. <laughs> they want someone to look after their kids and that's all they're looking for. And so that is a cultural thing. It's a socioeconomic thing. It's a family thing. So, you know, thinking about multiple generation families, especially, you know, can I exercise with my grandma? Because if it's only for 14, to 20 I'm not coming <laughs> so yeah. thinking about you know what is it that the community itself needs um, and 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 uh, incorporating that into the policy into the structure of the sport program so I certainly think that that is uh, something that can be done uh, from my personal research looking at uh, university athletics or uh, the research that I've done on Caribbean uh, communities and cricket or uh, Brazilian communities and uh, martial arts, capoeira. Uh, what I hear from women and girls in those settings is that they want um, leadership opportunities. They want mentorship from people who look like them. Uh, they want to uh, feel as though they are being listened to. So I think right now, especially we're in an era of have a town hall, do a focus group about it, bring everybody together and ask them what they need. And then some organizations think that that's the box that they needed to check. What we needed to do was ask them. We asked them, we're good. <laughs> but what we really need to do is ask them and um, think about how we can actually implement some of the things that they bring up. And if you're not prepared to implement things, then don't ask them, actually. It's better to be more transparent and say, you know, we're moving ahead with this policy that we thought of, rather than we want to include as many newcomer voices as possible. And then you only listen to one group or uh, you don't listen or it, that their, your actions don't show that you have listened to anyone at all. So I think, you know, I guess the core of, of both of those, it comes down to uh, connecting with, building relationships with the communities, uh, listening to them, and actually trying to implement change with their leadership. Bring them into your organization, give them paid <laughs> jobs so that they can be part of the transformation. If, we, if you need to start a program that is only for um, racialized trans leaders, then do that and get some <laughs> leaders in your community. It's, it's, we are past the point to say like, nobody applied. We just don't know any trans folks. So we didn't ha end up with any, you know, we need to do better. Oh, thank you so much. And there was a comment that touches on that in the chat as well about, oh, the excuses, right? That we, well, we're going to need an extra personnel in for the, in the same gender, or these limitations are funding. We see that in coaching, right? For women in coaching and, oh, well, no one applied or, well, it's just going to cost us too much to have a caregiver accompany you. Well, yes, that's reality. And there will be no babies unless you do so, <laughs> you know, like we really need to actually address some of these, these realities and loved your point. I mean, it's the art of communication and leadership to both ask and use the input that you're asking for. Don't ask otherwise, because it, clearly you don't actually understand the reason for asking. So. Love that message and um, and what else? More comments. We've got. I've I've invited everybody to ask questions, and as they appear, that's great. But otherwise, let's keep going. We've got about five minutes left, and uh, let's let's kind of finish off with this idea of okay, how can we use sport? What role can sport play? You know, it can be a blueprint. It can be uh, there can be examples. The stories. I mean, if we can leverage some of the stories that are occurring within sport, what else? How else can we use sport to drive change? What role can sport play? 
Uh, I'll dive into this one and kick us off. I, I mean, I think there are some tremendous examples across this country of really powerful sport programs. I mean, free play is just one that, uh, you know, Tim and I go way back and I just have so much time and um, enthusiasm and support for the work that they're doing in Edmonton. And uh, Ruke, you know, the, the kids that show up and the power of that connection that you build with each of them is, it, that's what it should be about. And so back to my earlier point, it's like, how do we really listen? We were just talking about how do we really pay attention to the people and what they need and how we create that safe, welcoming, supportive experience for them to be in uh, a sports system. And sport is going to look different across this country. We have a rapidly changing demographics in this country. It doesn't look like what it looked like 30 years ago. It doesn't look like what it looked like 10 years ago. And we really need um, the organizations, the facilities to come together to have these conversations, to connect with the communities that they need to be serving that they maybe aren't yet, and be really innovative and open to how they do that. And uh, so I think we have to start there and build those relationships and listen and learn and stop kind of resting on, resting on what was. Awesome. And we had, you know, there's over 100 people signed on to this. Uh, we've had over 70 in the webinar, so we can make that call to them, you know, go and speak at wherever you are, whatever table you have access to, and uh, share these kinds of messages. Here's what we can do right now. I know I sit on a board and, and yeah, there's the statement that's been made and, and then and then now what and you can feel this kind of stumbliness of what next but the going out is crucial and listening and uh, serving instead of pulling. I love it. Okay. Yeah, sorry, just to answer the question in the chat, like where free play gets the funding. <laughs> it's a fun, uh -huh. we do grants like it's nobody's business. Like if there's a grant, we're writing about it, and we're getting that grant for uh -huh. sure. Um, and, <laughs> um, we also, like I mentioned, Jumpstart um, when, uh, yeah, I mentioned Jumpstart earlier today and um, they're a huge supporter for free play for kids as well. They make a lot of the things that we do possible. Um, so Jumpstart is a big one. Um, and a lot of our donations also is just like donations, like monetary donations, like it's grants and monetary donations. That's why I think it's so important that this funding that's coming out needs to go to um, like somewhere, somewhere like Jumpstart because it's so much easier to access those fundings from Jumpstart than it is from like NSOs and PSOs because they just come up with all these kinds of criteria that is just, anyways, regardless, like uh, Jumpstart, definitely a huge um, supporter. Um, grants, federal federal grants, provincial grants. Yeah, Jumpstart is incredible, for sure. Um, they uh, they really do, like they provide a, uh, like our entire office. Like it's, yeah, Jumpstart, donations and grants, I would say. Um, so it'd be really nice if some of that money that's coming in like would go uh, to Jumpstart so they could keep supporting awesome grassroots like free play for kids and so much more, so many, other organizations that are doing incredible work to make sure accessibility is what that is like accessibility and that's from ranging from all kinds of individuals with vast experiences with uh individuals with different abilities like it's just we have to keep in the back of our minds that everybody's different and we just have to make sure that we're touching and making and making sure that those spaces that we're creating and sport recreation whatever it's safe and it's inclusive and we're doing that you know, like even playgrounds across the city, like so most of them are not accessible to so many different kinds of kids. Like let's start there. And recreation, recreation is that has sport like attached to it so much. Recreation doesn't have to be come and play sports. Recreation can come sit down and let's chat. Then that's fine. Like we need to make that and that's okay. You don't have to kick a ball to, you know, gain um some of these skills that are, you know, you do it in sport world. But Right on. Some great messaging today. I know, Gail, you had your mic on and we have a minute. We can definitely, uh, whatever you have to share, and we'll finish off there. I want to um, also keep in everyone's mind, how do we keep the momentum going, right? We're going to be busy getting back to normal. And how do we keep this momentum? How do we keep tapping the athletes who have these platforms to speak out? Uh, that's another great avenue. And they are great coaches as well. They can be d turned into wonderful coaches. Um, Gail, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to um, point out something that we're seeing on the funding front right now is, uh, and again, I think it's capitalizing on the social 
attention that's uh, put on all of these issues at the moment. I'm seeing organizations position their funding asks to say, well, we're going to include people with disabilities or where we're going to include, you know, underserved populations, and then they get the funding and then there's no accountability on the other end. And so, and we're seeing it very, like very quick turnaround, whether it's facility access or whatever it might be, we're aware of organizations that apply for funding stating that they're going to be inclusive and then turn around and are not inclusive. And so I think, you know, if for the, for the individuals out there that are controlling the funding or the accountability or those kinds of things, please make sure that you circle back around and make sure that they actually done what they said they were going to do. We all need to get the hammers out, I think right now, <laughs> you know, and make sure this stuff is happening. Yeah. And I mean, there's an issue at board, board tables, not quite understanding the role they play in holding accountable the organizations they are serving and overseeing. Beautiful. Thank you for an amazing hour and a half. Uh, I think we you're really you're amazing quick talkers and throwing ideas out there. Um, Amara has her hand up or are you clapping Amara? I can't tell. And but weigh in if you have any comments you'd like to make to wrap up. And thank you for your questions and for your attendance and participation to our our amazing group of registrants. I'll be in touch. I think we have to just keep the ball roll rolling. Part of my secret agenda on these webinars is to connect people. Uh, I know you, several of you are connected, but to keep this wider community connected is crucial. Uh, that linking of arms, we're always more powerful together and to keep this, this work moving forward. Okay, thank you, Amara was clapping. All right. Take care, everybody, and we will see you again in about a month. Uh, Amara and Karen and I will put on another one with another topic. We welcome your suggestions for topics that we should be investigating. I'd be happy to hear from anyone. And uh, take care, everybody. See you soon. Thank you. Bye.